And so tonight's event, I'm very happy to be presenting Arthur Huang. Arthur Huang is an engineer, a structural engineer, an architect, and the leader of the circular economy. Um, he founded the firm MiniWiz back in 2005 to upcycle trash material uh, into new materials that we can use. Um, and it has been a, a 20 you know, decade long making. And him and his team have leapfrogged existing technologies, inventing new technologies to help decentralize the waste transformation effort, enabling uh, the, the, the economy to transition into an upcycling economy. Many ways an author has been recognized by the World Economic Forum's Technical Pioneer Award, Obama's Emerging Leader, uh, Financial Times Earth Award, Wall Street Journal's Asian Innovation Award. And uh, in 2019, the World Economic Forum has named MidiWiz as one of the top 11 companies leading the way to a circular economy. Arthur, you have been very busy. Yes. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, guys. Uh, Thank you. So maybe for, for those who who don't know you and your work, just help us break it down for us. Who are the major stakeholders? What are the respective role you and your firm? Um, what gave you that idea back in 2005? No, first of all, in 2005, I just graduated from Cornell and uh, when, sorry, uh, earlier in like 2002 financial crisis, you come out, you don't have any architecture jobs. Yeah, so you got to figure out something for, uh, and then obviously we want to, focus on something that has a greater good uh, that deals with the community uh, mm -hmm. and have deal with some of my frustration when I was studying architecture. Yeah, um, that was, mm -hmm. um, uh, and so that frustration led to uh, embedded footprint of all the buildings. Uh, how can we design a building that is more damaging to the environment than actually protecting ourselves against the environment? Okay, so that mm -hmm. was the general premise and also because we went to Rome, most of the Cornell architect went to Rome. So, and then when you found out all the beautiful buildings in, um, uh, in Rome is built from trash, mm -hmm. literally. And, and the material is still constantly being reused in every period of time from the Renaissance all the way to the medieval, uh, from the medieval age, all the way to the Renaissance. And then, then return again in Baroque time. And now it's still being reused and these buildings are being quarry uh, uh, into new generation of buildings. So I, I just see that um, complete life cycle is being extended, the material life cycle is being extended um, generation after generation after generation. So yes, that's an inspirations. And from the economic situation during that time, we had a little advantage of having no work. So we had to figure out what we want to do with our lives. So then we step into this a uh, never ending row, basically. I see. I didn't realize that they were built from, from trash. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Oh, what okay. Do you mean by uh, that? So uh, actually, uh, as you guys um, architects most know, um, the Roman buildings are actually made from uh, the real structure element is actually concrete. The formwork mm -hmm. is actually wood and the brick. So the brick is serving as a decorative uh, element and also serving as a um, structural formwork, okay? But in between the real layer that holds up the aqueducts, that holds up the structure, it's actually all made from, uh, a lot of them are from amphora. Amphora are the mm, Roman period's um, single use waste. It's basically all the terracotta um, uh, bottles um, shipping all the oil, uh, grain, um, rice from Egypt everywhere to Rome, and then they broke it, and then they turned that into uh, building construction material inside. So the aggregates inside, a huge percentage, are leftover buildings, dead animals, dead people, dead packaging, um, you know, and that's the actual structure. On top of a brick, if you're in the uh, what we call government building, then they start cladding it with some travertina, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes what we know of Roman architecture or even today as a uh, architecture today, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so I just find that 
that premise is very interesting is that they're being as efficient as possible with the use of material from the very beginning, mm -hmm. sourcing the, the, like the trash of a city as the mm -hmm. structural component. Wow, I didn't know that, thanks. No, but you, know, you I'm sure we have the same professor, no? Jan, oh. we- Yes, Jan Gaben. Yeah. <laughs> But anyways, it's, I, I, and then uh, recently we did a documentaries also exploring with another uh, archaeologist to see the section of a building uh, of these uh, Roman structures. Mm -hmm. And you see, uh, and you know, you can date the building based on what type of trash is inside of this mm -hmm. uh, structure. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so then, okay, then wh how are you guys, what are you guys doing? Uh, and how are you guys getting yourselves involved um, in, in against the trend that, that, that you're seeing? Oh, I mean, uh, I think everybody talk about ESG constructions, right? And this is the mm -hmm. newest thing. Uh, about two years ago, the biggest thing is circular economy, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, about another four years ago, five years ago, it's all about uh, what do you call uh, zero footprint architecture, mm -hmm. net zero mm -hmm. architecture. I'm sure you guys mm -hmm. heard a lot, right? And then, then before that, it's about green building, right? And mm -hmm. sustainable architecture, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you, do you see like, you know, the term keep changing, but the logic is continue to be exactly the same. Uh, it's called embedded carbon footprint, LCA mm -hmm. analysis. And that is one of the things that we've been focusing on since 2005, everything we do, we have to actually have a layer of consideration of its embedded carbon footprint. From the first product we make all the way to the first building we make, we did a set of ISO 14,000 uh, LCA analysis you know, with a third party to um, uh, did, do the due diligence of how much environmental footprint you actually use to create the building. Um, the, there's a toxicity uh, footprint in everything we touch. Mm -hmm. in everything we touch. Doesn't matter if it's a piece of wood, leather, um, there's a toxicity footprint involved in the production process. There's an embedded footprint in every single one of a process too. Means you know, how much energy do you take to create this product, including coring the material. Mm -hmm. So I would keep explaining to people that um, the trend is to use marble from Brazil or onyx from some weird places um, it has a lot in better footprint because you dig away a mountain and then you cut them and you then you ship them right and then you mm -hmm. install on site and so these are what we mean by footprints uh, in better footprints so uh, what's the revelation we had uh, within the like i would say in 2007 and 2008 when we are involving in doing the calculation of a building is that if you use local material, period, just local material, uh, the embedded footprint will be reduced by 40%. Doesn't matter what calculation you do. It's mm -hmm. just like, whatever you do, it's just gonna be a lot cheaper, more efficient than existing building just by using a local material. And mm -hmm. um, so it's good for environment and it's also good for finance, okay? Um, for the construction costs. And if you use, um, uh, the trash that people already use. So you're creating the second life or third life with the uh, material that you throw away in the urban environment, okay? Then you are actually saving additional 40%. This is a general number, but every project is a little bit different, but I would say the ballpark are almost quite similar. After so many years, so many projects we built, um, at the end, it ends up to be around that number all within that, um, that uh, zone. Um, so, and of course, anybody in any little bit of civil engineering, a little bit of architecture, everybody always knows that we are always trying to do, architects are always trying to be a little bit urbanists. Yeah, we're trying to shape mm -hmm. um, the environment that we are part of. Uh, but I think what's interesting is if you step back a little bit, then the, the real saving yeah, it's of the, our environment should actually be our environment environment as mean the health of our environment, right? The health of a greater environment, our local environment, right? So, so then that's when we twist it to be, uh, if we can transform the pollution that we have now 
can we turn that into a building solution of today or tomorrow, right? So you basically mm -hmm. take an urban problem, we turn that into an urban solution. Can we, uh, or ag agricultural farming, there's a lot of ways associated to agricultural farming. Um, can we turn the agricultural farming material into um, a, a beautiful building product for a museum also next to the farm, for example. So this is kind of always the mindset uh, where we are going with every project, doesn't matter if it's urban um, or uh, rural, uh, but, but in general, this method of thinking is very rewarding for us, uh, but it also allows you to scale internationally. Can you show us some examples of that, that path? Okay, sure. Um, let me share screen. I'll just go. So the example I will show you, um, the, I mean, the recently, probably the craziest one that we do is that basically we turn Medical waste, as you know, like currently there's a lot of medical waste, yeah? Um, with yeah. Um, single use, wow, what the heck? Um, we're not even at the right page. Yep, so we basically have medical waste, lots of medical waste. Um, and we are building, uh, we built a plant um, uh, basically to take PPE and all the single use bed sheets, pillows, blankets, mixed fiber fillings and all that stuff. Um, and we sterilize it in the um, pressurized chamber. And then you up, go into an upcycling plant, you uh, disassemble the fiber and you turn the fiber into um, either a product-based material for PPE again, or you turn that into architectural material like insulation uh, panels. Uh, and mm -hmm. then we use that method, then you collect the material, then you build a hospital. Yeah. And so we built um, a 93 bed uh, hospital extension for the Catholic University here in Taipei. Uh, mm -hmm. Now it's full of COVID patients. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, this is using recycled aluminum, recycled PPE, recycled PP and PET. Uh, it's all oh. within this room. Yeah. How long does that take? I mean, from recycling to, to deployment? You know, this thing from R&D all the way to the certification for a new process, new material, medical grade certification and the built, uh, the whole thing is seven months. Incredible. Hmm. And I just want to, I don't mean the month, uh, actually was targeted for only four, four months. <laughs> So, and because of a COVID, um, there's a lot of restrictions on uh, not enough workers, things cannot come in from the poor, transportation delay because of a shutdown, all this stuff, okay? So this is already delay uh, under the original ambitious schedule because everyone wants the COVID related infrastructure to be up as soon as possible. Um, on top of that, um, I just want to use the time, the, the, the time frame for us to be able to do this is that uh, if you are geared with enough uh, technology modularized already, uh, you can really scale this internationally and very quickly uh, collecting local material and do it. So if you think about the manufacturing technique that you see in this picture right now, okay, the boards are made from aluminum uh, and the the core um, the corrugated board inside are also aluminium, so it's all aluminium panel uh, uh, using recycled aluminium. Uh, what do you call that? Um, ingots. Yeah. So basically, your Coca Cola cans get melted down into an ingots, and from that ingots, we extrude it into boards and um, honeycomb uh, wafers. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you sandwich them. Okay. So that's it. That's it for that board. Okay. And then you have to do medical grade coatings, um, uh, uh, UV activated uh, 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 oxide to be able to kill the bacteria and virus, okay? And then on top of that, you have uh, all the seals in between you see here. Mm -hmm. Inside is actually uh, custom aluminum channels, also made from recycled aluminum, but all the you know, secondary components are all made from recycled polyesters and PP from the medical system. 
Mm-hmm. And by the way, you can buy that in the market. You can go to a medical grade recycler. You can buy recycled PP uh, from medical waste already. I'm not joking. Yeah, this is readily available. You can buy it. Uh, the key is what once you buy it, what you want to do with it. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a part. Uh, so as you can see, that mini waste is really responsible for the transformation part of that game, and mm-hmm. editing with uh, you know modularization. So um, in order for to convince the government and the hospital to use the system, it has to be faster. We call it faster, stronger, and better. You know, it just has mm-hmm. to be faster, stronger, better, cheaper. It's just like in every level, it just has to be um, higher performance, um, mm-hmm. and. I think, unfortunately, for a lot of this example that we do, um, uh, right now this is an example of a hospital. I will show you some like fancy stuff um, that you guys. Um, it's, for example, larger uh, scale buildings like what we did in EcoArc in Taipei, which is a floor expo. Um, hotels um, for a um, campuses uh, for film innovation hub uh, for a school uh, for, you can all use the similar methods um, that you can use these material and create these uh, different style building. And this one is interesting, is actually collecting cigarette butts from uh, Switzerland. <laughs> I know it sounds weird, but yes, we actually have cigarette butt collection site in Switzerland, about hundred of them. And we come up with a machine to take away the organic part, which is the, um, ashes and the paper and then we just take the cellular acetate and the poa within the cigarette packaging <clears throat> and then that's turns into this giant black lung structure yeah yeah i think it's funny it's kind of playful you know? and then the yeah. chairs is actually done by the way the chair is done by a uh, well-known italian architect uh called cesare leonardi uh, mm-hmm. who did a uh, when he was young, he did a set of sculptural chairs all made from uh, construction waste. Yeah. And now we're turning his old design, a series of hundred into make out of cigarette butt boards. Mm-hmm. So this project mm-hmm. is called Anything Butts. Nice. I mean, okay. Yes. So these are examples. Okay. Um, I, I see we have a few more attendees. Um, for those of you who have just joined us, we're speaking with Arthur Huang from Many Wits. They're an innovative pioneering company that recycles consumer products into new building material, inventing new technologies to allow decentralized recycling, uh, which well, I understand, Arthur, is one of the bottlenecks for wider participation, right? I mean, I can imagine, for example, if we were to try and recycle knock on the first thing that comes to mind is where we're going to find the space to, to do some of that. Um, and, uh, and so that's what we're looking at. And right now we're looking at some of the projects from MiniWiz. Um, currently the, the, the mic for participant is not enabled. So please, if you have questions, enter them into the chat box and we'll go through them one by one after. But the idea is that I think we'll try and keep this um, presentation to about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and then so that we can have more time to open the floor to participants so you can ask questions. Um, all right, so what, what is that? What are we looking at? No, it's just our mission statement. And that's actually okay. my plan too. Uh, um, I, I mean, I know we're a bunch of very poor engineers and architects. How the hell can you afford playing? But I mean, we, we make, um, we have all these weird projects that we see ourselves striving into. So this is our mascot. Uh, so mm-hmm. we can begin by saying uh, who we are. Um, the mission is to be, as natural as possible. And by the way, that's the same as my architecture thesis is the nature of who we are, right? So it is mm-hmm. to strive to become like a plant. So which is like zero waste and beyond. So it's like within the ecosystem. And mm-hmm. who we are is basically, we want to you know, be a trash material and innovation company. So if you're a trash innovation company, you need to have a mascot that strive for what is its ideal. So for us, the highest form of any design is an airplane. Or, you know, you know, the reason is that it is the, it's using the least amount of material, but it's, uh, it's, but it's performing at the highest level of um, buoyancy, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Or uh, speed 
and in terms of transportation. And one of the key is every single bit of a design is not done for the sake of, how do you say that? Like a, a frivolous Zaha Hadi well, curve, you know? So, sorry. Uh, so that's the, uh, so that every curve means something. And then it's actually trying to use the material as efficiently as possible. And that's where we get inspired from. So we bought a night, uh, 1975's um, plane by Bert Rutan. Bert Rutan is um, the most famous, uh, at least for me, uh, aerospace engineer. Currently, recently just launched the uh, Virgin Galactica um, um, the airplane to, the, to Richard Branson to the space. That is the guy who designed it. That is a plane that is also the founder of that company. They also did the Predator drone, which you see everywhere, B-2 bomber. So this is a precursor of that plane. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a uh, when uh, Bert Rutan was young, it's about democratization of flying. He thinks flying should be everybody's right. Okay, so he, he designed a scheme by giving people the, his engineering drawing by hand. Okay, and then he Xerox them and they can build it in the garage with the material they find in the hardware store. And that is the wow. first prototype of the, the 14th prototype of that plane and actually hit some record on the lowest um, um, uh, fuel that travel around the world. Uh, and so there's a lot of memory why we need to buy this plane. And there's also a reason uh, when we bought the plane that came with a, a set of analog drawings. We 3D scanned the whole drawings. We, re, we did scan the whole drawing, uh, whole plane. We disassembled the whole plane. We, uh, and then we put it together in a digital way and physically. And then we invented new materials to fit into the wing of this plane uh, based on trash based on recycled polyester. So we invented a couple of new material and engineering process uh, based on this airplane, yeah. So you've flown it since. So this was that. And then right now, of course, how are you going to be not a poor architect anymore? So that's, we have to make money. So our vision is to be, you know, circular construction projects and, but we have built over 300,000 square meters already. Okay, so, um, and this is just a, a kind of brief video of uh, what we have been doing. We want to matter. Arthur, we can we, Max, can we oh, enlarge the center, the video? We want. Thanks. We want to matter. We want to matter to the non-toxic future of our world. We want to matter to the sustainability of our community. In many ways, it is our mission into a circular. It is the only way for us as a species to sustainably consume our limited resources. Overconsumption is a complex system problem. There is no single miracle cure. We want to matter by proving human consumption can be satiated with our very own trash. We have dedicated ourselves to turning decades of environmental pollution into solutions that will enable us to live sustainably. We want to matter, so we turn ourselves into magicians of trash, inventing new ways of transforming our everyday trash into high-performance works of art. We turn milk packaging into the hottest sportswear fashion plastic bottles into luxurious textile, cigarette butts into furniture and glasses. We want to matter, so we infiltrate the cities where the desire for luxury is cultivated. In Milan, in Berlin, in Beijing, in Taipei. We want to matter, so we design scalable technology, machines, softwares, utilizing the material and carbon footprint that we have already created. We research new ways to reuse trash, localized collection for turning waste into new products. Today, 
Our lab has innovated over 1,200 new materials made from trash to unlock the upcycling potential of everyday waste, available in our cloud material database. We want to matter by giving our future generation hope. Please join us in this trash revolution against our own selfish inertia. Let's stop talking about the problem, take responsibility of our own action, and start doing it. Because we all matter. Maybe. Well, anyways, waste pollution and collective phase, we all know that. Turn that into building. We all kind of get the gist of that. Um, and these are what we call generating place making impactful projects. Um, we always like to collect the materials directly from the consumers that's local, um, that's at the local site. So we will have drives to collect the material for textile, for PET bottles. For example, this building in Taipei called EcoArc is exactly collected um, 1.5 million PET bottles and turned that into this whole curtain wall system. And even the structural bones of this is from highway constructions. Okay, so no foundation, nice story tall. So how do you do a nice story tall, no foundation in a typhoon prone place? You use water. Uh, basically, it's a, the basically the uh, climate cooling pool is the foundation. So we cannot drain the pool underneath of that building because that pool is actually the foundation. Um, so uh, who we serve, initially we serve a lot of brands. Um, I would say consumer brands. Uh, that's where we learn uh, how these brands are uh, using the material, how they source the material, what are the trash they have, what are the process they have. And we also help them to build their headquarters and stores. And now um, in the last couple of years, uh, most of our um, clients are real estate developers as the consumer market for real estate is starting to pick up on these uh, cleaner, healthier, uh, more sustainable environments. Um, basically all the recycling you see out there is unreal. It's actually fake because none of the data is actually available. Um, so most of uh, recycling is actually called heat recycling, means burn it. In Hong Kong, worse. It's called sending it to China and throw it everywhere, right? So it's even worse. But anyways, hopefully um, Hong Kong will do a lot more of that um, uh, on-site recycling and government is doing that, which is great when I heard. And we were involved in one of the government tender, which we didn't win with Hong Kong government. So to build recycling plant. So, um, and this is the whole idea is to turn consumer into a recycler, okay? And in between, there's a lot of, on the whole manufacturing process, the whole circularity process, there's a lot of technologies missing. Uh, in the last uh, four years, I, was, I think you would meant to see a lot more of what we are doing here on trade back system, um, fast identification technology uh, to take material directly from consumer and make people see the direct benefit of recycling. Okay, this is a material database um, that we try to uh, have all the material data in there so you can do all types of digital simulation right away. Um, and where we are now uh, is a specialty contractor and we link to turnkey contractors for developers. Uh, but eventually uh, we're teaming up with different developers to do a lot more. Uh, and just the 2020, we did this for Singapore government, which is a PPE recycling plant, which we just mentioned, uh, basically turning waste medical fiber into new generation of medical uh, uh, textile and or into um, antibacterial, antiviral architecture, uh, insulation panels and fixtures. And then we apply a lot of that technology into hospitals uh, we recently did a whole COVID extension um, with this negative pressure ICUs. Um, uh, so this is a system that it's like prop in place that can be built within um, 24 hours per room, but at the end it's not that short because we couldn't conquer the most difficult part of all is our toilet. Yeah, we did not have modular toilet, so the toilet takes way longer than everything else. So. Uh, anyways, it's just a, and just to show you the scale of deployment or how big the project can be. And the reason why this is quite important is that 
the, this is a dry construction for hospital. And I don't know if you guys know, dry construction for hospital is even more and more important these days because there's a lot of digital technology is embedded into this room. So if you notice that this room has been taken apart and put together, taken apart and put together because all the new digital devices are just literally everywhere. So behind it is so many um, gas lines uh, for oxygens and um, uh, sensor lines for all kinds of medical treatments, uh, the new generation of uh, remote medical care. Now, without dry construction, the it's just impossible for you to add any sensors or any of the medical equipment. The other one we always been focusing on in the last four years is um, uh, decentralized mobile recycling. And so this is, this is a video. Four years ago, many places around the country to create the first mobile recycling line. Okay, is there a way to turn up the audio of the video? Machines, shredders, Thank you. Ovens, and other industrial equipment. Trash Presso is able to recycle trash anywhere. While TP1 traveled around the world, MiniWiz developed a new generation of Trash Presso, a modular system with a smaller footprint for easier transportation and higher energy efficiency. With a new system of heat induction presses and specific molds for different parts, the process has become faster and more efficient. The new Trash Presso complements Robin, MiniWiz's smart trash collection system. We will track every single piece of your trash from the moment you throw it away till the time we put it back in the game. Furthermore, new Trash Presso can be upgraded with a robot arm that will do the dirty job. So we are directly turning like uh, the ocean trash uh, we collected from Technology, the beach and we directly turn that into building tiles ingenuity, for the shopping mall. Creativity and passion. And now it's going to Monaco. This is Trash Yacht Presso 2.0. Uh, but this system, uh, we, we did this not because we want to make money because we did not make anything. Uh, we are just doing this um, to we set up a shop uh, to collect uh, trash, to collect data from people. So, so the machine can learn you know, how this whole process work. And we need these data to make this thing actually work. So we use an exchange system where they come in with their trash and they can buy anything with that point in the store. Inside has like trash made sunglasses, trash made chairs. Uh, you can even join a workshop to make all kinds of uh, mosaic tiles for the boardwalk. And wow. yes, that's... You just keep going. There's a lot of these. Um, Thailand, um, it's going to be in UK, London again, Denmark. Um, there's a couple activities is going on in UK after the COVID. Uh, actually, in September, there's a couple uh, coming online. Um, and so for us, these are all part of a, a strategy, okay, to uh, take trash directly from consumer and turn that into building materials. And um, there's all kinds of from, I just want to quickly run through this. This is literally two minutes. Um, I go from, we work with Nike. This, for me, architecture starts with uh, your clothes. That's your house, yeah? Okay, uh, so it's almost like uh, our freshman project, uh, emergency. Um, and it turns out this is very important now because we have all this COVID, this jacket, this mask with jacket, with trash, um, then into a chemical boots that's, um, you know, by the way, you can check those. Those are, um, Nike are already selling these shoes. These are all the development uh, pictures. And then uh, three years ago, there's a shoe that's under my name, uh, but the what the whole concept was, everything is green from the materials it's sourced from all the way to the packaging. The packaging becomes the store. The store also become the, bag and the 
uh, display case of the shoe and it become also the bag for you to take away from the store. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the house, uh, again, going back to the house, uh, one of the biggest issues is everyone talk about how trash is not sexy. So I know sexy is not a good word, but trash is not, house is not, um, uh, how can you make this into a, a palatable format where there's high form of art um, and also high level of sophistication. So everything you see is already made from trash, including the artwork. Um, of course, the creativity is a key. The technology, I think it's secondary. By the way, all the technology here is done by us. So even from the waist sweater you see on the carpet, it's actually a bunch of Eileen Fisher sweater. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So Gucci's uh, jumpers uh, into chairs. They're still quite beautiful actually, the material wise, but um, so you can see a lot of that. And I think it's not very fair though, because this place is very beautiful without putting anything. So you put anything in there, it's already beautiful. So we intentionally pick a place like that. This was our office uh, in uh, Milan. And now this office is moved to Monaco and inside has like uh, five bedrooms so artists can go there and live and enjoy sleeping inside the trash sweating inside trash um, and then do their artwork so we have a couple of art collaborations uh, done through this space mm -hmm. and i think hong kong needs one yeah yeah and then of course you can get into luxury residence uh you can see from the sofa to the tables to the ceilings all the way to the hotels, uh, all the way to banks, uh, lobby headquarters, uh, we work, just code, uh, co-working spaces, Tamasek shop house, um, financial institutions, lobby, um, all the way to Nike's headquarters uh, in New York, Tokyo, Shanghai. You know, it's, it's just, it, after a while it gets quite boring and then retail stores. Because once you get to material, literally can go into everything, right? Once you pass a certification, you can go to every, everything. Um, so we're, that's why we need to scale through real estate developers. Um, it just through my own power, it's too little to be able to see these things getting to a um, scalable format. And uh, next time you go to Italy, uh, welcome to visit um, every, any one of these uh, super uh, cities, um, classic cities, you will find a two-story stores that's made from um, cigarette butts uh, with Philip Morris. Um, and I think it's very interesting as this construction uh, because it's everything is, all these buildings are uh, 900 years old, 200 years old. There's nothing you can touch. You cannot do electricity, you cannot do any new structure, it will take forever. But our mission was to task to deploy, can you deploy 10 stores, these big stores in these historic places within two weeks, you know? So just imagine that. So, um, so we had to build a Lego system and bring the machine at the construction site and the machine take the material and pop out with the Lego brick and the Lego brick interlock itself. It has electricity, sound, air purification all in one. So there's no more additional work that's needed. So you just need a ruin and you just go in there with this brick. Yeah, kind of, basically that's what we did. Incredible. It's still there, these are all permanent structures, yeah? Yeah, Arthur, we have a question from the, from the audience. Um, this is from Nelson Chen. And uh, he, he notes that the Thank you for the innovative design and inspiring commitment to recycling and upcycling. Your approach might be described as research-driven design and design-driven research. How much of your work is devoted to material research versus design applications? Um, in the beginning, we spent material research, mostly material research and very little design applications. Um, and as we scale, there's more application and come back to research. You're totally right, it's a symbiotic process, but in the beginning, it is starting from one or two materials, uh, directly trash source from, for example, we started off with plastic bottle, then the bottle cap, that as the material research. And from there you develop applications. 
from applications and come back, then you need more other more materials. So you have to go source other more materials. So it come so the latest and coolest material research linking to um, applications is oyster. I, I I know people might sound it's kind of funny, but oyster is the like, oyster is like the biggest um, waste, uh, one of the biggest waste in in Taiwan, uh, at least in the oyster farming industry. Oyster shell, and also in Indonesia, there's probably a lot of shrimp fishing, shrimp, okay? They clean and, the water. Huh? I thought oysters clean the water. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, af after you take away the oyster, you have the shell, no? Yeah. And the shell is becoming a, a major nuisance because it's a calcium carbonate. But what, I mean, this is not what I discover. It's been discovered 40 years ago, okay? We just turning that into applications applying into the right materials and right metrics. So this is a, something called kitasen. Uh, it's a, it's a jia ke su, okay? Uh, so in all these um, shell animals, um, all the material has, it has an antibacterial quality, antiviral quality, okay? And, but they are waste and they are uh, uh, calcium carbonate. By the way, all your floorings, doesn't matter what type of PVC floorings you have, it's going to have calcium carbonate in it. Your concrete and cement has calcium carbonate in it. Okay, so mm -hmm. it is one of the most used um, building construction material everywhere. Okay, but the by burning these um, uh, uh, powder uh, into a uh, what we call a control burn. Okay, you can create. The, the polarization of the material. So once that material get polarized, uh, ionized basically, ionized, then the, the bacterial membrane gets destroyed because of uh, their, uh, they get attached onto it and the, 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 the protein shell gets broken and their DNA leaks out. And that's when you destroy the uh, antibacterial quality. And recently, for example, that is integrated in many of our um, building products. Okay, and I, I see that as a imagine you can have antibacterial concrete now, <laughs> antiviral concrete wall, or you can have paint that's antiviral directly um, apply uh, onto that and with waste already, not using metal, right? Not using silver oxide, not using titanium oxide, not using copper oxide. Those are all what we call biocides. Normally they are quite toxic in the process and they are also um, toxic to our body actually. So, so just by ionizing it, it, be, it develops an antibacterial property. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Okay. It become a natural uh, calcium carbonate ionized uh, germ kill. Does it, does it wear off? No, it doesn't. <laughs> That's the cool part. But you need to go into this slow burn cycles. So you need to get to 800, down to 500 and back to 400. And then, then you have to have a slow burn. So it's kind of like you have to control the burn. Like, a, you know how you barbecue, you have the ash. Yeah. And at the end, the ash become wider and wider and wider. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But some ash flies, right? Those are called fly ash, right? Some ash gets denser and denser. So you need to get to that. You need to create that denser and denser one. Yeah. So that's why the control burn. Anyways. But and now we are working on dispersion um, uh, machine to be able to disperse mm -hmm. that into a mortar mix. So for example, this is huge, I think. Uh, I think for any architects, uh, mortar mix is always, you know, with molds, with bacteria, you know? So can you do a mortar mix that doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, do that? And the reason why we had to get to a real estate developer is that, look, um, if you go through distributors, if you go through these um, existing uh, building material channels, it will take forever for you to break the inertia of the existing business relationship. It takes long, long time. Building industry is as dirty as it gets. Uh, not dirty, but uh, not corrupt, but the, the money relationship is very entrenched, okay? So we have been trying so many years to go through the um, official channels, doesn't work. So now we go directly to the buyer, right? The buyer gets to say whatever um, they want to buy.
right? You don't need to go to the guy who sell. Yeah. Okay. Questions? I mean, you can just show you some cool pictures and then you can. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to say, I was going to, I was going to talk about the inertia that you, that you spoke a little about and, and how do you, you know, what is the largest obstacle um, to, that you see today in terms of having a widespread adaptation or a, a sort of opinion change? Has that already happened? Um, where do you see architects role in that? Um, and what are some of the barriers? So for example, as an architect, I mean, as a small practitioner, practice owner, even if I said today, I wanna to go all you know, zero carbon materials. If I go to my suppliers, I won't, I won't get very far. Um, what, how, how do we, what can we do to sort of help in that process? Make your own. From, from your perspective. Make your own or work with us, you know? <laughs> so from my perspective, very simple. You make, I think I explained that earlier, just like make your own or we do it together. You know, um, we are definitely looking for people doing together, except people always think that we don't know how to make money. That's why it, we don't do very well in Asia, as you can imagine. Um, I also know Hong Kong people quite well. I marry, uh, I mean, quite a lot of Hong Kong people. Um, so I know it's all money driven. And, and I know there's a lot of, they need want to, want to see like, how much do I make? Uh, what do I get out of this? Like they just want to know that right away, yeah. And if you're in that mentality, then you always pick the one that's faster and easier, yeah. And that's the difference. Uh, we're we. I'm in a hurry too. I'm always in the have that urgency, constantly trying to do better, trying to survive. Uh, but I just, I mean, maybe that urgency for money is just never that much of a priority. Maybe that's why my investor kind of sometimes don't like me, but. Um, but in general, um, yeah, like, I mean, I think architects need to be, or the designer needs to be that light with a higher ideal. Yeah. And that higher ideal is where we swore, at least, or I, I think one other thing I always refer back to when I was in Cornell, what's the first thing that people said when we were in architecture school, the first class, architects fiduciary duty. I know American loves to do that. Uh, you're the brightest and the smartest and your fiduciary duty is this, yeah? Okay, uh, for a safe environment, yeah? Okay, <clears throat> and we're not doing that. Architects, I think, my criticism to my own professions and to structures and all that stuff, my own profession is that we are not thinking the higher cause of our job. It's like doctors, you know? Imagine you, you swear to be a doctor. Your job is killing people. Come on, right. But our fiduciary duty is as an architect is to have a higher calling for a safer environment. And we are doing the opposite. That's where I get my anger and my passion from. And I think I'm still living that <laughs> anger <laughs> since I was in school, by the way. I just... I was very uh, tactical. You found a very productive outlet. Yes, I find very productive that. But when I was in school, I was always a very good student. Um, I keep my mouth shut. Um, I like my professors. I respect their thing. I, I was, uh, I'm sure Winston knows I'm definitely one of the uh, good students in school. Yeah, on everything. But mm -hmm. I just keep my mouth shut. Doesn't mean I agree with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. So this project, I know like while people is asking questions, I can say, I think this is for us. When people talk about bio architecture, I think this is the one that we closest got to, okay? Um, this is um, a, a digital um, pump. It has two pumps that regulate the pressure of this whole structure, the mechanical, structure is done by air, it's pneumatic. Okay, so it's like a pump up sail, okay? And this sail is linked to a series of sensors on the top of these thing. 
So they are actively uh, like breathing, which is like a flower. There's like adjusting to the wind condition, uh, weather conditions, sun conditions. Okay. And it's also powered by the solar. And so literally it's not burning energy. Um, it's actually, it is actually, if you calculate embedded footprints, solar panel has chillers and uh, embedded footprints too. But I'm mm -hmm. just saying, trying to generate as much energy as possible in its own and uh, because the pump it goes on and off like like every like 40 seconds for two seconds at an interval right so it's actually adjusting micro adjusting um it's um it's environment uh so and the construction time is you know, you'd be surprised it's literally um the install time is literally a day uh, but the coverage area is huge uh we have a column install first uh stab into the ground first and then, then on top of that, then you just, I don't know if there's a video uh, there, yeah. And then, then you just, you just, this is one day and then you crane it in in the morning. Okay, now it's locking in, yeah. And then these are all made in factories first and the fabric are made from recycled PET bottles that's collected on site. And then we, then we turn it into a, a giant, like this architecture cloth, um, double layer and then it's, then it's like, then you turn on the sensor, then it's there, you see? So you can let it dance if you want. Um, we never tried that, maybe we should, but anyways. That's so, really cool. So this is in Thailand, the uh, uh, in Thailand airport. As you can imagine, airport is the highest wind um, area. So it's the providing shelters for the um, king's bike path that's what's called actually yeah i see and we built an island yes uh, in rio but it did not open unfortunately but it was finished um because the Co uh, zika virus and we were going to do lots of things for the tokyo olympic because of a, another virus <laughs> and we got stopped again so you see um as the global warming and the environmental issues gets more intense with the, our uh, human development, we are constantly being disrupted uh, by these global events now from one Olympic after another, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. And it just shows the importance of us um, as a practitioner in building physical environment needs to also protect its own environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. You're welcome to ask any questions. I really don't have any more things to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Did you did you fly that plane after you have made upgrades using trash? Not yet, but I did fly it before. <laughs> <laughs> Illegally, as usual, but. Um, so, so the materials that you develop in your lab, I mean, what are the procedures that it has to sort of go through before you can bring it to market? Or do you really just try it and test it and then, and then when they come knocking on the door, then you go through and, and, and do the test? No, we have to, to get all the tests, right? Like if it's a uh, fire okay. code require, is it um, B1 require, A1 require, um, is it uh, which, I mean, is it uh, replacing wood? Is it replacing stone? Is it so, so okay. So then, so then, arguably, the, I mean, I understand that there is a there is a carbon footprint involved, but then potentially, if you want to use an or create an innovative material, the timeline is much much longer. What are some of the incentives, or what are some of the the, the conditions that allow that to happen? When the project is at a certain size, and that's why we lose a lot of money in the very beginning of our career, is because all our project is small size but we're trying to do this, right? But now yeah. I know what is that size that's needed. I, you just need to have a budget uh, close to around $3 million, you know? US. And then, yeah. And then, then you yeah. can really yeah. like get a uh, manufacturing plant. You can get localized things. You can really play with lots of things. But if you are below that size, it's normally quite difficult for you to get involved. So. Um, uh, and of course, that's what we are aiming for uh, in many of our projects. Or you can combine a series of small projects 
For mm. example, one of my friends is buying a lot of apartments in Hong Kong, right? And then turning that into smaller apartments to rent, yeah? Okay, mm -hmm. so for example, that could be a series of um, material usage that adds up to a certain dollar amount. And that already becomes quite a very uh, interesting ecosystem in itself, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, do we have any questions from the audience? Any further questions? Is it because I said the word sexy too much? No, no, you're fine. Um, let's see. So for, I mean, if I were to just play that scenario out, uh, I, this is, I'll ask questions on my own. If, if we are, you know, for a small firm, or for younger firms, if we're not, if our clients are not asking for it, and we want to bring this in, then we need, you know, we need to. You said three million as a as a as a budget to be able to deploy ground up material. How, yeah, yeah. What no, a, I, if you have a around like, a, uh, I mean, yeah, yik and uh, NTT, but it's like that's around the like uh, three million dollar, um, and you can. For example, if a client or you yourself is building a house, right? If you think mm -hmm. about $3 million is actually um, not that much. My brother also lives in Hong Kong. His interior decorations has already cost 1 million. Mm -hmm. I mean, what the heck? I was like, what? You know, mm -hmm. and so you, you see what I mean? That construction budget is 1 million, but the problem is you have to be uh, comfortable with not dealing with a lot of a traditional niceties uh, or the traditional services the contractor gave you because mm -hmm. the traditional contractors uh, gave you a lot of comfort. That's why you trust them. That's why they um, the clients get managed and all that stuff, expectations and all that. But if you want to do that, you want to be able to control that budget yourself. That's why mm -hmm. in the beginning, all meaningless projects are turnkey. Mm -hmm. we have these um two or three turnkey project a year um basically we just do everything yeah um and then because of that you build up a lot of um, technology and repertoire to fulfill that demand of course you might lose a lot of money in the beginning um because uh you make mistake right so mm -hmm. this high tolerance for error I think that is the part where designers and architects and engineers are really good at. You have problems, you have to last minute solve it with something else, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the creativity constantly going in all our projects, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing ever go according to plan. And you have to be able to sacrifice that comfort a little bit in the first few projects. Mm -hmm. We have a question from the audience uh, from Jay Lee. Are your fabrics commercially available? Uh, yeah, they are. Uh, you can buy our fabric uh, directly from uh, Everest. It's one of a Nike supplier. Uh, it's developed by us. Uh, you can also buy directly from uh, Far Eastern. They both of them, well, they are one of the biggest thing, uh, biggest textile uh, fabric supplier. Uh, but you know, for the architecture's fabric, uh, we normally, you can buy a lot of customized fiber, uh, uh, fab, uh, textile directly from us because we do use fabric like a wallpaper and we turn that into very three-dimensional. And that's actually one of our uh, kind of a pre-chew uh, product that uh, it's doing very well, I think. Um, actually, out of all the product, surprisingly, it's this fabric-based thing is the most people, are, is the most popular because they can use it everywhere. Yeah. And it has no like fire problems, yeah. Do you have some photos of the fabric? Is that the, the antibacterial ionized drape that we saw earlier yeah, or was it almost, the luxury fabric? But if you see any of our projects, like almost all the walls are already made like this. So it, just, it can be hard, it can be stick-ons, it can be uh, curtains, but they're all like that. They go all over the place, yeah. So Winston, so, um, 
Do you want to start your own factory? I'm tempted. I'll, I'll ask you more about the cost and pricing. No, but if you have a cost and pricing, have it beforehand, you won't do it. Well, no, then that's a target. Then that's a, that's a fundraising target. <clears throat> yeah, you just dive straight in saying, I'm going to do this. And then, then you'll find out. <laughs> I mean, I yes, I meant it as a joke, but that's exactly what happened to me, right? So then you know, wow, okay, oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. But uh, well, it's quite yeah. fun. When you when you when you approach your projects, I mean, do so. I guess people come to you with we need a certain material, or we have to satisfy certain um, ESG requirements, uh, accounting yes. requirements. Yes. Right? Um, yeah. So they always ask, "Is there any substitute for this?" But whenever they ask for substitute, they actually want the price to be half the price, along with satisfying all the yes. requirements. Yeah. Okay, and if you want to do premium, it's normally, it's just very small volume demo only. Mm. Uh, and I have to say, unfortunately, this is my dilemma right now. Yeah, mm. okay. I cannot do half of a price. Uh, I will, actually most of our project, you see, we built a lot of projects. And, uh, and then if you actually do the analysis backwards, we are actually losing money doing those projects. Okay, it's because I need to fulfill that price barrier inertia to get into that thing. So every one of these projects are more like a suicide projects, right? You're going there knowing that you will lose money. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, so I, I don't mean that in a good way. Uh, that is one of the issue. That's why you need to get to a certain size. So for you, Winston, if we go, if you want to do this in Hong Kong, then you need to find a, client or you yourself needs to kind of lever a project that's going to generate uh, like three million dollars let's say mm -hmm. and then that is uh, that is a knowledge i did not have before and if you have that knowledge now i would say it will not be money losing all the time because once you have infrastructure set up or familiar with the infrastructure everything you do after that is make money mm -hmm. But for the first, uh, I would say, 13 years of 14 years, uh, what we, we've been around for 17 years. So first, first 14 years, we are all about building repertoire. Mm. The strategy is to build as a, a breadth of strategy and solutions. So it's all modularized into a kind of toolkit. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it's kind of like if you want to have a store, right? You cannot go to a store that just buy you know, like yeah, one, sure. it's almost impossible. Sure. Uh, we have two more questions. A, a follow-up question from Nelson Chen. Um, I understand that you were educated both as an architect and as a structural engineer. How has this education, this binary education influenced your professional direction? And do you have an interest in teaching? I remember you taught when you first moved back to Taiwan. Oh my God, I'm still, a, I'm still a professor, just a really bad one. I would say um, uh, I'm still teaching at um, Chen Gong University uh, and Zhao Tong University. I'm still one of those who I have like whatever guest professor, I don't know if you call it in Cornell, um, whatever you, yeah. Uh, basically you still have this teaching role, but I don't show up, yeah? So uh, this is uh, one of, I feel bad, yeah, this is, and they always are trying to get me, I don't have enough time um, to do more teaching. Uh, I certainly think education is the only way, okay, to train or to let our professional early on be familiar with this new generation of challenges. Uh, I tried that in Cornell very unsuccessfully. I tried that in Taiwan, still very unsuccessful. I was very frustrated with all the education system. Just the mm -hmm. school politics, like, yeah, mm -hmm. literally hates me, yeah, okay? Mm -hmm. And then other professor hates you. Um, um, uh, I am always trying to run into the engineering department and then the architects like hate the engineers, yeah? And then <laughs> it's like, the, it's always like in this weird, I'm always in this weird place. And then I always have a, 
Uh, but you see the opportunities from both sides, and that that must have helped you in, in choosing yes, yes, charting your own path, yes, right? Yes, and it, but it may, it may get you very frustrated. But yeah, but the 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 school, the dynamic of a school is still set in the nineteen seventies or something, you know, even Cornell. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and it's mm. you know like I was teaching. Uh, I love Jerry Wells, yeah, and then I was teaching a studio with him. You know, we were talking about carbon footprint analysis and Kellogg City at the same time. Got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, for, the, for, the, for the questions uh, from Thomas Schmidt, for some of the products manufactured from recycled plastic, are they durable relative to uh, uh, UV exposure? Okay, uh, first of all, uh, UV exposure is one of the easiest uh, degradation issue to solve uh, because the easiest way is to make the material slightly thicker. Okay, um, I just want to say uh, the reason why the UV breaks the carbon chain, etc. Yes, UV does break the carbon chain, but if you make the material thicker, it's like it's like firewood. Yeah, if you break the surface, the bottom is still strong. Then it still stays strong, yeah. Um, so structurally, if you make a material thicker, what people have impression of plastic material or single-use material is because you think it's not durable. It's only because we made it so thin. Mm. We made it so thin. But architecture has no constraint because when it's designed for single use, right? You put it in the sun, a, a plastic um, uh, case, uh, gets degraded in half a year and all of a sudden you hit it, it's broken, right? Correct? But once you get to architectural material, our building has been sitting for 10 years, 15 years now, uh, some of them, yeah? Uh, it, because when we engineer it, we already engineer for the degradation in front of it, okay? And we also use adding the UV cut, but I don't think UV cut is the only solution. It's like uh, additional to the uh, UV cut, you need to have, um, the right sensibility in the mechanical design on all the materials. And right away, you solve that issue. By the way, plastic is still, no matter what, how you calculate it, it's still a lot stronger, not mechanically stronger, but I mean, the uh, material durability is still a lot more durable than most of the metal products and stone products out there. Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot more durable. If you actually subject to the same test, uh, the reason is because uh, steel rusts, so you need to constantly do this um, uh, cool. upgrade and the structural quality degrades, yeah? Uh, mm. And so the durability is through coating, yeah? A lot of the durability of this is through co coating. Recently in Genova, the bridge, uh, one of my favorite bridge in Genova collapsed. Um, um, uh, you, you get, as you guys know, like the, everybody thought this steel and concrete thing is indestructible. But it's not true. The degradation actually goes a lot worse than you expect. Actually, when I was in Cornell, I was in the carbon fiber lab. Um, and one of the things that's constantly being replaced uh, and being talked about, but still not being implemented. And in the US now, for example, the infrastructure upgrade. How do you infrastructure upgrade a steel startup that's inside the concrete? You can't unless you just tore it down, right? And this is a huge issue because now you have no idea how to calculate that, actually. No way you can calculate that. Um, so I would say in terms of durability, if you get enough thickness, I, I think it's there. Um, and by the way, one of my biggest concern for a lot of the material these days is that we are using very high carbon, very expensive, high intensive material to do temporary building. I don't see any building is permanent these days, uh, especially look at the way how marble is being cladded these days. These are not permanent marble building at all, not at all. Uh, so we are pouring down building every 29 years based on the real estate RITS uh, calculations. So your material value actually goes to zero after 30 years. So, and then your glue go out of warranty after two years. The longest glue warranty I've seen in the market is 3M, five years, if you get the right VHB. Uh, so that's mean, 
insurance company cannot insure whether this piece of glass will fall off after five years, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you see, that's why people tore down buildings constantly now at much greater frequencies than ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you also just explained Nelson's question earlier about how engineering affects your, your thinking. I think that as an architect, I, I would have taken it for granted that plastic LTE is, was strong enough, but I would not necessarily think about the thickness of it or the degradability or the chemical uh, composition of it. Uh, a question from another audience, Peter Basmanjan. Has the Trespresso come to Hong Kong yet? How big is your firm? Is it made up mainly of architects or engineers? Uh, we used to be like a hundred people, uh, uh, mostly architects uh, and engineers. Uh, literally, like uh, I would say, uh, half half, and we don't call our architects architects. We call them architecture engineers. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the reason is because architect has a bad rep. Uh, whenever you go out and people think you want to talk about beautiful things and uh, conceptual things, so we mm -hmm. want them to also feel that we're helping them to solve a engineering or a systematic problem. Okay, mm -hmm. so we. So in general, we are mostly engineers. You, you mean in, in the in, in Taiwan context? Uh, Taiwan. Global, yeah, okay. Why? The, I mean, the, I don't think architects have the bad rep globally. Architect what? Bad rep? I don't think, yeah, I don't think that rep is global. Well, okay. But I think everyone think architects are opinionated a little bit or- Fair enough high level of sensitivity and beauty and aesthetics. Yeah. Fair um, enough. Yeah. So, I mean, I, in general, it's not bad rep. I'm saying if for a sustainability field, I'm, uh, I think it's like you want to step back as a level of an engineer where you are trying to help, help mm -hmm. uh, to solve a problem for the team rather than leading the solution. Okay. Uh, that's why we want to step back a little. If you see our Chinese name, it's also literally like that. It's about uh, being smart in a small way rather than being smart in a big way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, that is okay. So that's the first part of a question. There was a second part of a question. I remember. Um, has Trespasso come to Hong Kong? Have you tried to bring it to Hong Kong? Yeah, um, yeah. There's there's a lot of opportunity to bring it to Hong Kong, and pretty much due to COVID, it's not in Hong Kong. Okay, um, and uh, we are we. I I hope I hope uh, uh, with the MRT corporations, uh, uh, we can do a lot more together. Yeah, and there is a, a lot of public activation potentials with Trashpresso, um, but but Trashpresso is the down dumbest of our version. Uh, and the why the dumbest means, uh, I mean that in a good way. Um, dumb is good because you want to be able to take multiple material and as less accurate as possible. When you get directly from trash from consumer, you want to be as inaccurate as possible to still be able to create something. Most of our manufacturing process are way too precise. If you buy any machine from Japan and Taiwan and Korea or Germany, Everything is too precise, yeah? So right now, trash presso is a dumb version of a uh, precise process to be able to uh, still produce quality product within that imprecision. When you talked about data earlier on, the, you know, the reason you try to so around the globe is to collect user data. Is it to train the AI to recognize the consumer product and behavior? Oh yeah, first of all, recognizing uh, consumer, um, the, the actual material that's been coming in, Yes, that's one way of training the camera. Yes, correct, totally, visual recognition, yeah? So I need mm. to have X amount of data to be able to say this is this or that's that, yeah? Mm. Okay, that's it. and by, by the way, human eyes, my eyes, or many Unreliable, of our engineers' right? eyes in our office, we can already do it. Except the computer is so dumb, you have to train it, yeah? But technically our human eyes can already do it, yeah? Okay. The second part of that thing, the data, is the, um, the uh, customer experience um, to collect the points, to actually run through the process, yeah? I see, So yeah, education as well. Yeah. A follow-up question from Thomas, that relative to your earlier reference to the US infrastructure upgrades, 
Do you see any potential for recycled plastic materials to either encapsulate and protect existing installations or provide selective replacement? I, uh, I definitely see uh, structural form work to protect the uh, structure integrity of the structure is definitely very likely. Um, I did not bring the slide, but one of the um, using waste, there's uh, plastic uh, as an extruded sheets. Polypropylene sheets is actually stronger than steel. If you think about it. Uh, by, uh, by molecular weight, by its tensile strength is stronger but maybe not uh, the rigidity and stiffness and all that stuff. But um, in terms of, if you're using it for a tensile quality, it is stronger, okay? So it's almost for you, it's harder to tore them apart actually. So imagine if you uh, can come out with a structural, um, imagine the inside is all rotten. You want to strengthen it. Instead of strengthening it with a metal jacket, you might be able to strengthen it with a um, uh, recycled plastic um, sheets. And we did try that before and it works really well, except the, uh, the, the, what are the, the how do you say, it? the piles that you drill into the thing, there's no replacement material, it's still using steel. So you still have the rust and you still have the, uh, to, to bind, right? You need that little, you need that rod to go in there to bind with uh, all the existing aggregates uh, to make that whole thing whole. Um, so I think that is still years away. Uh, at least we haven't come up with a solution. Uh, many of industries still haven't come up with the right solution for that. Um, but I definitely see there's a lot of potential for um, uh, small upgrade just to stiffening a certain area and also waterproof because plastics are very good at waterproofing, very, very good at waterproofing, especially if you want to get additional stiffness with additional waste glass fiber, which is plenty. Waste glass can turn into glass fiber too, um, can mix into the material and that actually become quite a um, uh, interesting structural material to use. And uh, recently there's a um, one other thing, everybody know 5G, 4G, 5G. I know like what the hell are you talking about 5G, 4G, but telecommunication is doing going through a level of upgrades that we've never seen before for this IoT of things. Um, by the way, all this data as traveling around the world, uh, it seems like Wi-Fi and digital or satellite, but in reality is actually transferred through optical cable. And the fact that there is a tremendous amount of tonnage um, in Taiwan alone is around 2,000 tons of um, 2,000 tons of optical cable being um, oh, sorry 2,000 uh, thousand tons yeah being <laughs> being take out okay every year just to replace to get up to a um, keep up with our data volume okay. So the data volume just keep increasing, right? Just like our server room, just keep increasing, keep increasing. And one of a very interesting material we found recently is that um, we're using these optical cable, they can actually replace startups for, mm -hmm. uh, for any type of um, infrastructure building projects. And they are naturally coated IP62, fully <laughs> waterproof, it's designed to be like sink in the water. So. And the, right now we are working on how to get the right type of uh, surface. Um, you have to roll a surface. Um, Tension. Uh, no, like a surface pattern uh, on yeah. the, to, the to grab onto it. cable to be able to grip onto the yeah. uh, concrete uh, cement uh, in a uh, much more uh, mechanical way. So we are going through a series of tests right now to, um, fuck, okay. To get past the, I just broke the chair. So, okay. To get past the, um, uh, the the new construction and building material certification in Taiwan only. But if you are to do that in the states, I don't know how long that takes. But very cool. All right, I think we're coming up on eight thirty six. Um, do we have any more questions for author? 
by the way, so if it weren't for COVID, if the borders open up again, does that mean we'll start seeing the trespass over here? Yeah, most likely, yes. Uh, because there before COVID, uh, Trespresso uh, was going to, during the Olympic launch was supposed to, last year was supposed to be in Hong Kong, Tokyo, and New York, and uh, all at the same time, yeah, okay. And that was a, a project that's already um, failed uh, because of the COVID. Um, mm -hmm. But then we continue to have a couple of initiatives with real estate developers and M uh, MTR corporations. So we can have the thing. So we definitely need to um, look for creative professionals like you, Winston, potentially to come up with different design, right? Because the whole idea is to localize the design for a certain project or for a community. Mm -hmm. The architect should be embedded locally, right? Um, not, and, and we are just providing that, we're just enabling that with a little bit of a dumb machine, no? So mm -hmm. that's just our part of a job. Mm -hmm. So All hopefully- right, well yeah i was just gonna say um thank you author um for sharing with us your passion and your baby for the last 20 years um <laughs> very inspirational um i hope everyone enjoyed it tonight um and uh i hope we'll see we'll see your products in hong kong before too long actually you see a lot of our products already in hong kong sorry you... i mean i mean we'll have the capability of Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But, so uh, but if you guys are interested to see some of our work already in Hong Kong, you can see the Nike Lab in Hong Kong, um, in um, uh, Causeway Bay. Yeah, in Causeway Bay, and uh, we also did a couple of projects for Sino Group, for um, Nan Phone, for um, New World. Yeah, so. I don't know. Some of those projects are internal. I don't know if they were, whether they it's they um, uh, communicated, but some of them they are all small scale at the moment. So hopefully it will get uh, scale in a more uh, visible way in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much, Arthur. Thank you. Ciao. All right. Thank you so Take much, care. guys. Ciao. Thank, Thank you. you for listening. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.